Whereas other things are very easy to reach. For instance, if you're hungry, and you're able to, it's easy to find food in our day and age without much effort. If you're looking for some other entertainment, it's really easy to find. But when it comes to looking for love or happiness or any deeper search that is more than just a momentary instant gratification, in direct proportion to the profundity or to the intimate goal that you have will be how difficult and how seemingly challenging it will be to access. But this shouldn't disturb us because that's how things work. The more valuable something is, the more effort is required to find it. The digger you deep, the, I'm saying the, the more value, the more pressure something is, the digger, the deeper, the deeper it's buried. And this is true both in our own inner potential and other things in the world. You know, it's, I don't know if it's connected to it, but when we think of precious stones or uh, fossil fuels or other natural resources that we consider to be valuable, it's interesting, they're all buried somewhere. And they're deeply buried. Maybe precisely because of that, that's why they're so valuable, because it takes so much effort to find them. So is the diamond actually beautiful, or is it because it's so difficult and exotic to find that made it so beautiful? You know, it's hard to really determine this, because people psychologically... You know, if, if diamonds were all over the place, you found them like the dust, like the, the, the grains of sand at the beach, would we have any value in them? You'd say, yeah, hey, you know, another gra grain of sand. A grain of sand is also very beautiful, if you really put it under a microscope. You know, there are many beautiful things in this world. But going back to good old economics of supply and demand, if something is in low supply, it usually becomes high demand. Simply because you want to show, I have it and someone else doesn't have it. It's harder to find. But that, you can argue, is a commercial dimension of it. But on a more, on a more uh, called, uh, uh, permanent level, the truth is that the deepest resources in our own psyches, our own inner strengths, always come with hardships. It's only when you're deeply challenged when some of the deepest strengths come out of a person. Or as the expression used, you can use it also Hanukkah related, that an olive does not produce oil until you press it. And there's pressing it once and pressing it twice. In the Talmud there's a whole system of pressing oil. And the same is psychologically and emotionally in our own creativity, when is the greatest creative surge from a human being? When they're under pressure. It doesn't ever happen when you're complacent and comfortable. It happens when you're in pain, usually. Or a lost love. Or a yearning for something very deep. So it's precisely the things that frustrate us and most are the ones that bring out the deepest creativity, the deepest powers. I mean, no one likes to, to announce this, but the fact is, it's not a cliche to say that war is the father of all invention. Because war, when you're at war with a defined enemy, and it's not just a psychological war, a real war, that urge to win, to not allow yourself to fail, creates such creativity that no, no, well, nothing, no, no, no institution in history has created more creativity than war. Obviously, this is not a justification for war. It's a byproduct that just teaches us what so-called challenges, resistance do. And on a very basic level, one of the analogies given for it, think of it like a flow of water. A flow of water is flowing down a river or a riverlet or any type of flow. So it has its uh, so-called uh, rate of pr pressure rate. But then you really want to build up serious water pressure. What do you need to do? You need resistance. You build a dam. You build something that blocks and stops the water from flowing. And the water starts building up and building up. This isn't just for water. It's for wind, for electricity, for anything. The more resistance, the more it builds up. And then at some point it breaks through with such intensity that you can never imagine if you didn't know this, uh, the, this thermodynamics, you, would, you wouldn't know that this little bit of water can become a, such a destructive force or such a powerful force. When harnessed, can change worlds in a good way. When uh, not harnessed, can destroy in terrible ways. It's always resistance that creates the greatest pressure and the greatest force thrust forward. This is the basis of most engineering, especially 
um, when dealing with anything that's related to motion or related to, to spacecraft or to aircraft and so on. The pressures that in our turn become catalysts for, uh, for a forward thrust. And at a practical level, another analogy given, the more you draw back, the farther it goes. If you have a bow and arrow, the farther back the archer will go back, the further with the arrow will fly. So the same is also in our personal lives. Obviously, everyone has the immediate question is, how do you have the best of both worlds? No pressure with greatest results. Well, it doesn't work that way. It's always going to need pressure. The question really should be rephrased, how do you have healthy pressure as opposed to unhealthy pressure? Do we have to wait for something destructive or, God forbid, something that hurts us to wake us up to that type of intensity? Or can we impose upon ourselves a pressure on, 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 your, ter on your terms, but pressure? And then you initiate it so it doesn't come as a surprise and it also doesn't come in ways that are beyond our control. Like one great Hasidic Rebbe once told one of his students, who was able to hear this, you don't tell this to everybody, he said to his student, he said, Remember, everybody, life breaks all people. Everybody needs to be broken. The question is whether you break yourself or if someone else breaks you or God breaks you. So always best to do it yourself because when it comes from somewhere else or from above, it's not always on your terms. It's not always so, it can be, in other words, overwhelming. And we see this all the time. And I met a fellow who I remember was literally on his deathbed. He was sick. And he, uh, not going into details, his life was far from uh, meaningful. Okay, even though he's associated with the Meaningful Life Center. Um, but um, living a frivolous life, and of course, when you're on your deathbed and things are at the, at the last moment, uh, you start thinking about what priorities are, and what matters, and what doesn't matter, and so on. Um, and at, at, when he was in that state, of course, he made major decisions on how he's going to live his life, that if it's saved, and he comes out of this, he's never going to go back to his original place. Well, lo and behold, he was saved, miraculously. He came out of it. And the doctors had given up hope, but he came out of it. And even more, sur surprise, surprise, he went right back to where he started. And I said to him, so what was, what was all that? He says, it was like, you know, I remember I said it, but I now don't feel it. So this is the common, this is the common, what's, I guess, epidemic, I don't know what we call it, phenomenon of human nature. We get inspired one moment, another it dissipates. So all this is uh, going back to what I originally was speaking about, finding relevance in something, in a deeper level, in the deepest level, finding out what you, really, what you really care about sometimes takes that type of pressure. Challenge yourself, or allow yourself to be challenged. And often it happens when you don't want, which means you lock yourself into situations where you can't really get out of that situation. So with that in mind, and actually this itself is the theme I want to discuss, titled, uh, Are You a Flame or Are You a Wick? Are You a Flame or a Wick? In the context of uh, Hanukkah. So Hanukkah, we all know, is the festival of lights, it's called. Okay. And its uh, main focus, or its primary mitzvah, if you want to put it that way, is lighting the menorah. So Hanukkah menorah consists of eight branches and uh, coming Friday evening before sundown, before sunset, um, we begin lighting the first Hanukkah. Hanukkah can light this, this year and the Saturday night after Shabbos will be the second and Sunday night the third. And that way the whole week, and again it will conclude this year, again Friday will be the last, the eighth. When you light all the eight flames. So it's a nice, uh, it's, it's always a warm and a nice nostalgic experience, for many at least. Some don't like it, but I can see there's some beauty to it. For some it reminds them, as I said, nostalgic. As the guy that said nostalgia is not like what it used to be. Um, so nostalgic in the sense of reminding of family com gatherings, uh, the gifts you get, childhood memories. For some, unfortunately, this season is one of the worst because it reminds them of the dysfunctionality of their home life and families. Um, but even on the positive note, what is its relevance? What is its personal relevance? So there's an expression that one of the rabbis uh, says, says the following, he says, you have to listen, in Yiddish he puts it this way, 
So what's the lichtelach that sound? You have to listen to what the lichtelach. It's a uh, endearing way of saying the flames. But like, in Yiddish, just for the record, when you add a, like licht is light. You say lichtelach, it's like an affectionate way of saying, like little light, lightelach, you know, like that type of thing. Like, uh, so uh, my name is Simon, so my mother, when she is in a more endearing mode, she'll say Simon Ke, or, you know, you add the Ke, these little extra little words. When she's not such a uh, happy with me, she has other way of putting it, but I'm not going to. Um, so there's these little additions that you add, like little slang to everybody's name. You know, I'm sure you have these little uh, quirks we all have. So, to listen to what these little candles in an endearing, affectionate way, you have to tell us. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean literally that if you cup your ears, you're going to hear a voice. It means that, uh, that the sto- there's a story in these flames, and they have lessons for us. And beyond the fact that we're commemorating a miracle that happened two and a half thousand years ago, when the temple was desecrated by the Greek uh, Syrians, Greek Syrians, and then they could not find a cruise of oil to light the menorah which was lit every day in the temple. And then miraculously they found this cruise of oil and it burned miraculously for eight days. So beyond that commemoration, what is the story? What is the story does it tell us? What should we be listening to? So it really gets into, and I discussed this a few years ago, called the physics of light. You know, today, light is not just a small word. In the last century, with the, with the advent of modern physics, Einstein, and then later quantum mechanics, light took on a whole different understanding. Light became a, an essential force of energy. Light being not just the fastest uh, entity in existence, but also being the parameters of existence, understanding the dynamics of light, the particles and wave of light. Light, of course, is more than just light that it lights up a room, but light is also energy, really. Energy is a form of it's a transmission. And it's fascinating, which, again, is not the theme for this evening, if you are interested in the parallels between the physics of light and the metaphysics of light, go to uh, MeaningfulLife.com whenever you like and just type in, like, the physics of light or physics of Hanukkah, stuff like that, and you'll find, really, a very fascinating parallel. But you see that long before light became such a science, so important science, and very much a basis of so much modern technology, It is a central theme in Judaism. And not just Hanukkah. We have the Shabbos light, the lighting of candles before Shabbat. We have all the holidays. We have the menorah in the temple, which was lit every day. You find the Bible special focus. Even though there were other activities in the temple, the menorah and the lighting of the menorah has special significance. And also on the sad side, we light a candle for a soul that departs. A Yusker candle, a memorial candle. So these are not coincidences, it's not random, it's because something about a flame that's extremely powerful and central to our own lives. And in one word it is, the flame is the soul. And that comes from a verse in the book of Proverbs, Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam. The flame of God is the soul of a human being. Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam. So in a sense, when you think of it that way, what is the flame of God? What is the divine flame? What is the, um, the personality, the cosmic personality of a flame? So we have physical flames to study, and they teach us about what spiritual flames look like. Maybe for some people who are spiritual enough, they go the other way around. They know what it is spiritually, and then they relate to it through the metaphor of an actual physical flame. So I want to focus on here the two elements which are critical and necessary in any lighting of a flame. You need a wick, but a wick alone is a dead, inanimate thing, and you need the flame that's lit. I mean, truth is, what you need is fuel, wick, and flame. But as the fuel that travels through the wick, fuel alone um, will not burn quite the same way. You may not even be able to ignite fuel without a wick. Definitely channeling it into a flame that burns cleanly is that there's the, the fuel. Whatever that fuel is, whether it's oil or it can be wax or paraffin, but oil is usually used, Hanukkah is the best thing to do is using pure olive oil, the wick and then the flame. So the wick and the flame are really metaphors for two uh, voices, or you can say two uh, archetypes within ourselves. 
And we all have both of them. The wick, to go back to what I was saying earlier, is really essentially everything that we are preoccupied in this material world. Like a wick. What happens, just matter of think, uh, hypothetically, what would happen to a flame without a wick? So think of it, practically speaking, um, a flame without the wick would disappear. You know, at some point when the fuel runs out, or the wick burns down, there's no more wick. What happens? It burns out. So where did the flame go? Why can't a flame exist without a wick? Well, in a spiritual sense, the way the mystics put it, is that the flame expires into an invisible place. Like when you look at a flame in a wick, you can almost imagine, this is something you can study when you light the first Hanukkah flame and then throughout Hanukkah, you can almost see that the flame is rising. It's the only force that defies gravity. And in a way, the wick is what grounds it. Without the wick, there's no grounding. It's what keeps it grounded. So in a sense, take away the wick and the flame just expires upward. So the mystics put this in the spiritual sense of it. If a soul is like a flame, and the body is like the wick. Take away the body, the soul will not have any way to be contained in this material world. And this really is true for all energy. Energy exists whether we generate it or we contain it or not. But if you want to have any benefit from it, or you want to in any way recognize its, 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 uh, its, its power, you need some container to, which, which to, con to hold it. And that container can be a light bulb, and it can be another appliance. It could be anything where, you, where electricity is being channeled into. So in a sense, the wick in its broadest, uh, in, in, in the wick in its broadest sense is really the grounding of the energy of existence. So in life, therefore, we have these two poles that tug at each other, and tug in two different directions, rather, with the flame searching and reaching upward, and the wick grounding it. Now in a perfect life, if there's such a thing, but in a perfect balance, you'd have both. You'd have the necessity, like in a, in a healthy flame, that there's enough flame and enough wick not to, uh, to destroy one another. Which means just a wick on its own is inanimate. It's not giving off light. It's not giving off warmth. It's not actualizing its potential. So thinking of it in, our, in, in the way we, in our lives, the way the mystics put it, would be the following, would be, we are all born with, uh, with enormous power and potency within our potential, which means the power to give off a lot of light, a lot of warmth. However, that flame remains locked and trapped inside you, inside your body, inside physical existence. So the wick is what dominates in our lives. And we may have many wicks. A wick really is essentially a, a, a physical entity waiting for its energy to be released. And when it's released, it turns into a flame. So when we say in the Torah the idea of lighting a menorah, you'll see the focus is not just that the menorah be lit. There's the Torah speaks even specifics about the lighting of it. You have, for instance, in the book of Numbers, there's a chapter called Baal Otcha. It says that Aaron, the high priest, this is how he would light the menorah. And it says specifically, he would light the first flame and then the second one. There's a whole procedure how to light, how to kindle, how to ignite it. And to just give you an example of how significant that is, because you could argue, who really cares how he lights it? The bottom line is it should be lit. And who cares who lights it for that matter? You have a menorah that's lit, it's giving off light. But it's not the case, because we're not just dealing with the uh, idea of having, lighting up a room, so who really cares who turns on the switch? You're talking about a uh, metaphor and a symbol for all of life. The menorah and its light symbolizes the idea of all, each of us bringing a certain light into this world, illuminating others, bringing warmth to others. In other words, we are like we should be walking menorahs in a sense. You could say it's a form of all education is a form of giving off light. What is education? So a child goes to school. The child has a mind. The child also has the potential to comprehend ideas. Good education, really, is not teaching a child something really new. It's teaching the child how to use his or her tools to understand things. You know, the true education is not just about imparting facts. That's part of it. But that these facts trigger something in the child as the child develops and grows through education that allows it to actualize a potential, uh, something potential. That's what real education is. So both the educator is a, essentially a beacon of light, 
where like using the example I mentioned, I think one of the last weeks, was when we turn on a light in a room, what does it really do? Think for a moment. What does it do? It changes nothing in the room. I mean, at least not ostensibly. I'm not talking about on a subatomic level. Turn a light on the room. All it does is allow you to see the objects that are there. So before the light is turned on, you have tables and chairs and steps and other things. And you don't know where is what, so you could bump into the wrong thing, God forbid, or you may not use the, the item the way it should be used. You may not even know what's in the room that may be there that, that, you could, that can help you in your life. You turn on the light, suddenly you have awareness. The light shows you what exists. All it does is reveal that which is there already, basically. So in healthy education, that's exactly what's happening. You're teaching a person something that's there already. This way in our life, we begin our lives in living in darkness. Darkness is both, what do we know about ourselves? Very little. What do we know about the world around us? You walk down the street, you meet somebody. Somebody calls you. How do you determine what this person wants? Are they healthy, not healthy? Is it a dangerous person? They, they, they want to exploit you in some way? So young children are naive and don't have any knowledge. When you grow older, you get a certain savviness, a certain sense to not allow yourself just to be exposed. It uh, doesn't mean necessarily that adults are in uh, better shape because we could have other problems. But the idea of, of awareness, of growing into a place where you see things. And you can really see every expert, a professional. What is a professional? I'm talking about a real professional, not someone who just calls himself a professional. In whatever that profession they have, they have the experience and the knowledge. And I emphasize not just the knowledge, the experience they see, they look at the same thing that a non-professional looks at and they see something else. Or they see something deeper. They'll see patterns where we will not see patterns. And this is a professional across the board, from economy to science to psychology to, uh, to, to physics and metaphysics. What do they see? It's not some type of uh, magic. It's their experience and knowledge allows them to look at something and they don't just look at the trees, they see the forest. They don't look at the, 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 the dots, they connect them. And they see a pattern or, uh, uh, or, or reveal other things. Also they have objectivity in a way where sometimes we can't always see clearly because we are blinded. We may, have, we may be biased in a particular situation. Now we may be, we are, we're all biased. So when it gets to serious issues, sometimes you really can be blinded. This is, means you're living in the dark in a way. And when you see opening your eyes or turning on the light, it really means that you're not something new has been created you just shine the light where there was, where before there was ignorance or darkness so in this sense light can be identified with knowledge, with experience like I said earlier with education when parents teach their children things whether it's with words or with feelings or just with presence with love, that's also another form of giving light, when we love each other the difference between two people let's say, who actually feel deep love for each other, but they can, are expressing it or they're not expressing it. If they're not expressing it, it could be there, and they may even feel it, but expressing love is necessary because it's taking the potential feeling and igniting it and turning it into a flame. So it's so one thing when a person says to their spouse or to their partner, they say, look, you know, I have great warm feelings for you. And when she says, well, you know, I never see it. Well, if I was with, you know... Well, because you're never with each other. There's a, there's, it's not just enough to say you're potentially you can be warm to each other. You have to actually give off warmth. You know? So no one says, I'm able to give off warmth, doesn't mean they are giving off warmth. And a lot of people who say they're able and they don't do it, you have to wonder if they're so able, why are they ever never doing it? Why take them for granted? Or are they really afraid to do it or are they just waxing eloquent? You giving off warmth to each other? Huh? I see. I see. Uh, you acting out what I'm speaking here. That's very good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, if you think about it in those terms, Hanukkah is like a lesson, or a lesson. It really captures the essence, taking inanimate wicks, and that's what we're doing. We're, we're simply in real, real role playing. We're taking the wicks, putting them into, I mean, depending, everyone has their own type of menorah. But regardless, let's say you take the wick, you put it into uh, olive oil, today it's ready-made, or how people use candles. There's also electric bulbs. That doesn't quite capture what I'm talking about here. That would be like someone saying, I need a little love, and you send them an a light bulb or something. You know? <laughs> you actually need real warmth, real flames, 
real uh, fuel. Um, I mean, for display, it's one thing. I'm talking about the, the full mitzvah. Let's say. So, uh, you, uh, you, and you and you and you actually playing playing role playing. You're taking the wicks, which, as I said, are, are symbols of the material, and we don't yet know its potential. You take a, a match <coughs> or a match. You light the shamish, the main flame, the mother flame, and then you go from one. Depending on the night, you light a wick. If you think about it. Even though we do this so often and we take it for granted, it's like an amazing thing. You can take something that was inanimate, not alive, uh, st stagnant if you wish, and turn it into fuel of real life that gives off physical warmth and light to its environment. So it's a small scale, a little flame. Imagine every human being was trained from our childhood through our education that you are given blessed with skills and tools and physical uh, physical presence to turn yourself from a wick into a flame. To take your wick, or rather, and ignite it and let it feed a flame. If each of us knew that that is our ultimate mission, and more importantly, that each of us gives off a flame different than anyone else, that is the essence of why we're here. Had you not come down to this earth, or... Or had you, or you do you remain unrealized, unactualized? Then it's a wicks. It's like a lot of wicks that are waiting around to be lit. To go even further, the expression used, and this is, goes the lesson takes further. It's not just for us to light ourselves. We are lamplighters of others. That whoever you meet, you have the potential to ignite something inside of them. And again, not giving them anything new or something they don't have. It's all there. The fuel is there. The wick is there. Even the pile of flame is there somewhere. But every flame needs another flame to light it. And therefore, when you light it, you are essentially creating a type of ad infinitum force, like a ripple effect. One flame lighting another flame, another flame, forever and ever. This is what people like Abraham, the founder, could say of all religions, of faith, and Moses, and the great men and women of history, this is what they ultimately did. They were lamplighters. Beginning with themselves, they lit their own and live by th uh, that principle, that the material universe is essentially potential light and warmth. And they taught that to others as well. I mean, in a way, it's inevitable. If you are that way, you automatically teach that to others. So it becomes a, uh, a process where you don't just light, ignite, and, and touch someone else. That person, in turn, will touch another. And it's endless after that. And more interesting is that the only thing in existence... That the more you do of it, the, the less you never get diminished. You can light as many flames as you like. That original flame will not get diminished. Everything else you give to others, you have less once you give it. You may have love, more love and more satisfaction giving away, but the physically you'll have less. In a flame, it doesn't work that way. A flame can light another flame, another flame. This is, the Medra says this. And not only that, remember when flames come together, it becomes one more powerful flame and they join to the point you can't distinguish between the original flame and the next one. That's the ultimate satisfaction of a parent or a teacher. When they see a student or a child that's grown to a point where their light and your light confuse, and you don't even know who the teacher is and who the student is. I'm not, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way that you don't know it as in... But I mean it in a value way where, you, where your child has become and surpassed even what you've given them. That's the ultimate satisfaction to a truly, who's not competing. It says in the Talmud that we're jealous of everyone except our student and our child. Sadly, I've met sometimes parents that are jealous of their children too. But the expression in the Talmud actually, you know, everything is a nuance. The Talmud says, Everything a human being is jealous of except a son, a child, and Talmudah, a student. So what about those that are jealous of their own students? Or their... So the way the, or let's call it the more witty uh, teachers will say, well, that person means they're not an Adam. Because the Talmud says you have to be an Adam. You have to be a mensch. If you're not a mensch, not necessarily. Like you have also, in Adam mez ponov b'fnei ba'al cheve. No human being will uh, be have chutzpah to someone that you owe something to. You know, you may have chutzpah, but someone, if you're indebted to somebody, to have chutzpah to that person, a, normal, a human being won't have it. But the fact is that you do see people that do that. They say they're not an Adam. Anyway, that's just a little aside.
don't use that because you may insult somebody if you, if you tell them that. Because not being other means like you're like a subhuman. That's what it means. Like you're not a human. But the natural human being uh, has that type of feeling. So to go back to the wick and to the flame, that's in the general sense who we all are and why we're here. So when you light the Hanukkah flames, you're really less teaching yourself and those around you about lighting yourself and lighting others in that same form. Lighting that flame out of the material. And it also leads us to the discussion that I said before about balance. You know, if too much flame and too little wick can be too uh, overwhelming. Too much wick and too little flame, you'll have not enough light or warmth. So there's a balance and it's like a dance, which is called in the, in the Kabbalistic terminology the Ratze and Shuv dance, if you wish. Ratze and Shuv is an expression from the book of Ezekiel, with a vision of Yecheskel has a vision, the, the, the prophet, where he says, V'achayis Ratze v'shuv. I envision, I see, Chayis is like energy. The energy is running to and fro. Ratze and Shuv. Running and returning. It's interesting, the same verse there, he talks about um, what becomes the Hebrew word for electricity. Anyone knows the word? Chashmal. So electricity is chashmal. Where does that word come from? It's the word in the, in the prophecy of, of, of Ezekiel, of Yecheskel. You know, electricity, whenever you see the symbol of electricity, you know, they compare it to like a lightning rod. So lightning, like a uh, flash. So you see like a Z. Because all, all energy is, consists of two poles, a positive and a negative. I said earlier, the resistance. That, that, that creates energy. Like you see a magnet, either attracts or repels. That's the power of, uh, of, of two poles working negatives or negative, positive and positive. So, so in Hebrew they chose that chashmal word because that verse talks about the idea of running to and fro like an energy flow. Contraction and expansion. Exhaling and inhaling. All the key to all energy is generated through a, a dual process. Like we breathe. You exhale, you inhale. Your heart contracts and expands. A pump is simulating that. You want to pump out water, if it just stays in its own place, it does. You need the pressure, as I said, the resistance, so you contract and you expand, and then it pumps water. All, uh, all, all energy is generated in that fashion. It has to have at least a dual, well, not at least, a dual, a dual uh, process here. So Ratzi Veshuv, in, in personal terms, is the, are the two voices that we all have within us. One is the voice of transcendence, and one is the voice of survival. So we all know that a lot of our time and our day is spent on survival. What does survival mean? I don't mean it necessarily survival as opposed to uh, destruction, but the struggle for survival includes eating and sleeping and working, paying your bills, and all the means that required to get to that point. No. Survival is part of our existential um, needs. And that needs are very broad and they occupy most of our time. You can call that the wick in its broadest sense. But then there's also another part of our beings that you can say is, has transcendental inclinations, yearnings. And that is anything that you yearn for that is beyond survival, essentially. The yearning for meaning, yearning for deeper understanding, yearning for love, yearning for breaking out of this, uh, the traps of the mundane, the monotony of our routines. And we escape in the many different ways. We, we transcend. We can transcend through music and art and love and romance, religion, faith, spirituality, travel. Different ways that people experience this type of transcendence. You can also experience it in unhealthy ways. You can experience it in healthy ways. But these two forces, these two voices, these two, the truth is there are two souls within each of us, the animal soul and the divine soul. Yetzir Tov and Yetzir Hara. It doesn't mean evil and good. It just means one gravitates towards self-preservation and self-interest. And the other one gravitates towards the exact opposite, getting outside of yourself and beyond yourself. A perfect balance between the, two, between the two would be a perfect wick and a flame at work. And you will, you will not find it in this universe, the perfect balance. To understand what perfect is, let's talk what the most imperfect would be. The most, or most, 
uh, imbalance would be where there's one more dominates than the other. If your life becomes chasing your tail, in the rat race, of continuously struggling to survive, it has to wear you down. And the transcendent voice inside of you doesn't have a place to express itself. Some place it will give. At some point in a person's life, just, something will break down. It could be through depression, it could be illness, God forbid, it could be other ways, it could be just aimlessness. Because what happens is your circumstances are controlling your life. Everyone demanding something, your boss, your workers, your clients, your spouse, your children, your parents. I mean, demands in every direction. That's essentially a person who's become completely consumed or pretty consumed by the wick and, and materialism. It doesn't necessarily even mean the extremes of materialism as in greed or consumption or, or uh, narcissism. Even without that. Just pure, pure struggling for survival. If that's all that's going on in your life, what's happening, another voice, another part of you is being starved and searching for nourishment. And that voice is called your soul. And your soul, the flame that's locked inside of you, is desperate to be released. And desperation leads to all kinds of things. They said desperation can lead to all kinds of negative things. It could also lead to something very positive. Like a thirsty person, when they drink, they appreciate it a lot more than someone who's not thirsty. So that's like a wick-dominated existence. And a flame-dominated existence has its equal uh, problems. A person who's so... Um, involved in transcendence can sometimes and often lose grounding in a very real way. So there's one thing if you choose an ascetic lifestyle where you go to, you know, you escape to a mountain, to an oasis, insulate yourself. That's one thing. But most of us are unable to do that. And even that, is that really doable? Is it really, is it really the purpose? So actually in the Torah there's an incident, the episode of the great leaders called the scouts, who actually chose that path. And it became a grave sin, it became a grave uh, mistake. The scouts come back from the land, the promised land, and they say, it's a land that consumes its inhabitants. They see so many wick-oriented people that are so consumed with material pursuits, they just couldn't stand it. They said, this is not for us. We need to live in an oasis of a spiritual environment. And what their mistake was, that's not the purpose of existence. The purpose of existence is to enter into the material, into the wick, the world of the wick, and turn that into a flame. Not to escape into the world of the spirit. And that's, of course, much more complicated, much more difficult. So yes, we all begin our lives in a healthy environment, the way it should be, is that as children, the nurturing of our environment should give us the ability to nurture our souls. And we don't, we're not yet immersed or thrown into, thrust into the pursuit of making a living and all the corruption involved with that and all the challenges and the cruelty and the competition and hostility. And so. so a child develops 10, 20 years, hopefully in such a nurturing environment, similar also in their educational systems. I said that's of course the best scenario, but for a moment let's just go that way. And then at some point they're armed enough their soul has been nurtured enough that they can enter the world of the wick, the world of the material, of matter, and have the strength to turn matter into spirit. That's the purpose. So God is merciful. He doesn't thrust us into that world on our own. Nine months we spend in the mother, our mother's womb where we're completely protected. But that becomes something, place you cannot remain. You enter into the material, but in stages. As I said, in a good scenario, we grow and we learn the ropes, we learn how to assimilate and begin to adapt to a world that's not that's that's hostile to spirit to the soul and to spirit. And then we learn that our job is to transform that material into spirit. But you can't throw somebody into a world and just say, Go transform it. They need tools, they need strength, confidence. And that's what's supposed to be built into a child's life from the early on. Yeah, well, I wish every parent and every educator knew that from day one. We have a different world not about teaching our children just how they're going to make money. It's teaching them this. It's not a contradiction. It's how to make fuel, how to turn material matter into spirit. And in that sense, 
there's a process, as I just stated, that grows as we develop. And there, there is somewhat of a balance. What happens if you don't have that balance? So either there's too much consumption and too much over, being over-obsessed or consumed with the material of the wick, or, as I said earlier, there can be too much with the soul and you don't know how to deal with the world around you, which is equally not the purpose. So comes Hanukkah and teaches us the wick has to meet the flame. And they meet on equal terms, meaning they both need to be there. And they actually feed each other. Without the wick, there's no flame. Because the fuel is tr travels through the wick to create the flame. On the other hand, a wick without a flame is not actualized. It's just waiting for something to be released. So think of it like a potential. You have someone that you know, and they have potential locked inside of them. And you see it. So on one hand, you need a wick. You need something to ground it. But then you need to light it, ignite it. And that person begins to actualize, to begin to shine and illuminate. And then their light becomes a light that they can touch and bring to others. Now, as I said, these are in general terms. More specifically, the fact is there are some people whose souls are sent to this earth to be more, more wick-oriented and others who are meant to be more flame-oriented. Like for example, not everybody is an educator, full-time that is. We all educators, even if we're not professionals, you're educators of our children, we're educators of people, co-workers, people who work for us, people who we associate with. Not in the formal sense of it, but we are always giving off something. It could be positive energy, it could be negative energy. Remember, education doesn't mean that it's always good education. It could also be teaching people, by example, not positive things. But nevertheless, there are those of us that are more focused, who have the talent to be more full-time or more effective educators. Educators is just an example. So, that, so each of us, as I said, there are those in general terms, those that are more de dedicated to building the wicks and creating the so-called um, the fuel that will be ignited and turned into flames. And there are those that are more the lamp lighters. So generally, everybody is everything. But more specifically, we all have different missions in our life. And you can't always know exactly, but usually the circumstances of your life testify it, to it. Some of us gravitate, for instance, to the world of business. Yeah, it may be driven by making money, but money is connected to being creative as well. So you can't send just purely the money, even though that may be your real goal. And as I said, the pressure of making money, like with war, is the, mother, is the father of creativity, so we become creative and we find ideas and innovation and, and uh, ways to, to, to turn uh, wicks into, uh, into cash. Let's put it that way. Okay. But of course, if you think about it, does it end there? Depends what you do with this cash. You know. So some, the cash remains trapped in the world of the wick, which usually where a person is completely about himself or herself, they have no ability to give. Yeah, giving meaning both in this literal, charitable, financially, but giving also means a giving mode that what you've been blessed with, you share, and you know you have to give off light. But there are people whose strengths are in that area of building these wicks. They may need to be taught what to do with the wick. Then there are people whose strengths are in the lighting the flames. This can be people who have the skill, this sometimes creativity, as I said, educators, we writers, it could be um, uh, anyone that is involved in some way more focused on that idea of giving off light. The truth is, the way God created it is created that there's partnerships. Well, not, not none of us are good at everything. So a good partnership means where people complement each other and, and recognize that I can't do it with the part that you can do, I can't do, and the part you, can, you can't do, I can do. Unfortunately, the battles in this world most of them are based on either insecurity, where you don't know what you're good at, so you keep on thinking everyone's taking away your piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. or, 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 other, or, or other causes that create that type of imbalance. But generally, a person who's very secure with their strengths and understands their boundaries, that's the second thing, to understand not just your strengths, but your boundaries, that I, this is what I'm good at, but this is also the things I'm not so good at, and that's where I can turn to someone else. And if that can be determined properly, you have the healthy boundaries where, where you're able to complement each other. 
In the Torah, there's an expression. The expression, it's a, an idea that the tribes, the 12 tribes, the 12, 13 tribes of Jacob, each had their own strengths. And you see it in the blessings, both Jacob's blessings to his children before he dies, and Moses' blessings to his children before he dies. They talk to each of the tribes, and, with, and usually through their name, which implies different names. Reuven had his uh, purpose. They describe the 12 different paths that each of them would take. I may have done some, an article once on these 12 different personality types of the 12 tribes. <coughs> so, a two of them, well actually these 12 tribes, this is another reason when they left Egypt, the Jewish people, and they went across the sea. So it says it's split into 12 paths. Because it wasn't just each one a place to go, but it was a demonstration that each of them had their own particular path. They all lead to a higher goal and the same goal, but each in their own particular way. Like different musical notes in a large composition, each playing its own particular music. So two of these tribes are called Yisachar and Zvulam. Yisachar were known to be the scholars. Among the tribes, Yisachar was primarily scholars. I just want to reiterate again what I qualified earlier, important qualification. Just like with the wick and the flame, this does not mean that only that tribe had scholars. We all have all elements. It's just a question of what's primary and what's secondary. Like any, like a, you may be a very sharp business person. That doesn't mean you have no creativity. But it could be that your strength is in the numbers. Your strength is in the marketing. Your strength is in the selling of it. Understanding that bottom line. Creative people often are not that grounded in that way. So we can have different strengths, but there's some of us have a, this is called a, a, a primary strain or a secondary strain. So Yisachar and Zvulun, these two tribes, where Yisachar were primarily scholars, and Zvulun were primarily business people. And that's actually why Zvulun, the tribe, the section of Israel that they were given when they split up the land, when they entered the Promised Land, times of Joshua, Zvulun received the port cities near the water. Because that was where how you best, adult commerce and business was, it was, it was best there. And that's where they lived. And Yisachar's part of the land was more quieter and conducive to like almost like an educational environment, like a campus. So these are the, the different functions. For example, the leaders came from the tribe of Yehuda. The kings and the leaders of Yehuda. The priests and the, uh, the Levites came from the tribe of Levi. So different tribes had their role. Again, each one overlapping and had, each one had others, but they had their roles. So this partner, so Yehuda and, and I'm sorry, Yisach and Zvulun came together, the two groups, and said, look, we're spending most of our time doing business. Commerce, making money. Yeah, we hopefully give that money to good causes. And you're spending most of the time studying. We want some of your wisdom, some of your rewards, so to speak, or the benefits that come through academic, through scholarship. And and we will, we will provide you and support you. This is where the concept came of, basically, uh, it's fundraising. I don't know if that's the right word. Partnership between those that are educators or caretakers or, for that matter, hospitals and anyone that's serving others and those that support them. Someone who's spending 80% of their lives teaching or administering to others simply does not have the time just develop a business and make a lot of money. It doesn't work. It's, it's impossible to do both. On the other hand, the person who's in business doesn't have the time to study properly or focus. So though both are obligated to do both, but as far as time goes, there's only 24 hours in the day. So they made this partnership, and it became this Yisachar Zvulun partnership. In truth is, in healthy times, there was no need for one to go to the other and say, listen, I, got, I need some money. It was a clear partnership. But they understood that they were blessed with the gift of commerce and business for a reason. They were blessed in order to help support that which also gives off light. So here you have an example of more wick-oriented and more light-oriented, flame-oriented. This, by the way, does not mean that the wick-oriented are in any way inferior or secondary. On the contrary, as I said earlier, the purpose of existence is to transform the matter into spirit. But you need matter. So here's what Alter Rebbe once said to someone. He says, God bless, shall bless you with a lot of Gashmias. Should bless you with a lot of matter, and also bless you with a, and you should make from the matter spirit. So it's a two it's a two way street, 
And in a healthy environment, you don't need people to be reminded or told this because they understand the purpose. And both understand. The spirit needs the matter and the matter needs the spirit. Unfortunately, in a world where we get dichotomized and forget, and the flame and wick become like two different worlds, you know, so you can live in one world and, 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 and become so self-consumed or insecure that you have to hoard and hold on to all your matter. And the spirit can become so self-consumed with their spirit that they don't share with others. And they live insulated environments in uh, behind closed walls and are busy being selfishly spiritual. So there's a need for both of these. So there's a rabbi that got up to his congregation and said, we have a big uh, problem, we have a big hole in the roof. And I have bad news and good news for you. Well, good news and bad news, let's go the other way. The good news is we have the money to fix it. The bad news is the money is in your pockets. <laughs> you know. so I don't know if it worked or not. It's a good, you know, they got a good laugh. <laughs> so this is what we have. This is the thing. So if you look into chapter 37 in Tanya, it's a fascinating chapter where he talks about the struggle, how matter doesn't want to release itself and keeps on holding on to itself. Because you see, materialism is, is insecure by its personality. Spirituality is secure. And because it's insecure, insecure things hold on to themselves because they don't know if they give up, maybe they'll disappear. So he explains how matter has this like self-defeating aspect. It's all self-contained. The more you uh, depend and think that whether it's money or other physical possessions is what gives you security, the more insecure you become. Because security cannot come from something that's temporary. Security only comes from things that are timeless. Whereas the world of spirit, which is timeless, doesn't need to hold on, that's why it e easily shares in its natural state, unless it's unhealthy, because by nature, giving off light is not, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't diminish itself. On the contrary, it makes it stronger and greater. So these two personalities are in conflict with us all the time. Are you a giver or are you a taker? So everyone likes to answer, I'm both. You know, that's not... The question is, what are you more of? Um... So some psychologists, and especially if you use the Freudian, Freudian and Darwinian model, social evolution, social Darwinism as they call it, then you say, that, listen, survival of the fittest, and it's all about me. Everything is about my own survival. However, due to the fact that my survival needs other people, and I need love, and I need support, and I need a community, so it becomes a certain give and take in order to you survive. But it's all driven by personal survival, which takes on the shape of some, some type of altruism because that's what helps you survive. The Torah, which categorically and unequivocally um, takes a whole different approach, says the opposite is true. We are essentially givers. But because God sent us in this world where we have to transform matter into spirit, there's an element that becomes a taker. But that's not where we not really essentially are. Our souls are givers. And they're trapped in a world of takers, basically. To the point that this giver can become a taker and you can't even recognize that the selfless soul exists within this narcissistic uh, creature. And this is the battle. So on Hanukkah, when you look at the flames being lit and ignited, it's really about, besides the battle, it's also them joining forces. Like I said, Yisachar and Zvul, it's a joining of forces where matter knows it needs to be converted into spirit, and spirit knows it needs matter in order to fuel its existence. A soul cannot function on its own without the grounding, without the wick of the body and our physical lives. But at the same time, different personalities focus their lives in their particular area. Now, these implica the implications of all this are not just um, theoretical, they actually come down to how it affects our personal lives, how we love, for instance. How we love. Is love a taking thing or is it a giving thing? So I've shared with you, I'm sure, uh, one of the more amusing moments in my life, uh, though it was at the expense of others, but it wasn't amusing at the time, but in, in retrospect, let's put it that way. So this couple came to see me and... Um, and have what we call a domestic uh, issues, yeah. <laughs> challenges in their relationship. 
And they had gone through a lot of therapy. That was very clear. And finally come to the final, the, 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 the end of the rope, as they put it, the end of the line. So they, since they knew me, they were coming to the classes, they felt, let's try, what do we got to lose? So I asked them about the therapy they went to, briefly to sum up what happened. And uh, they described that most of the therapists didn't get very far with them. You know, here, back and forth. Um, it took a lot of money, but it didn't help them much. So finally they said, I said, any positive experiences? So they had one, there was a woman ther therapist, who they said actually helped for a while. But then that also ultimately uh, fell apart. Uh, what did she do? I asked them, you know, just to get a sense. It was not just to know what was done, but also to get a sense of what they were about and what worked, what doesn't work. You know, we went through, of course, all the usual suspects in relationship. There's a checklist. Your parents, you know, there's a lot of things to look at. Previous marriages, uh, etc. And she said what she did was she had them both um, list by order of priority, by number, um, <clears throat> what their most important needs are. So like, you know, the, from the top, the most important need of all is number one. A little less important, two. I think like the top ten or something like that. And then, you follow along, this gets very complicated. Um, and then, she had them both list of how much of that need is fulfilled through their partner, through the spouse. Also from 1 to 10. So, of course, the worst would be where it's your number one need and you get 10, meaning zero, amount of it being fulfilled by your spouse. But there are other needs that are a little less important to you, but you get a lot of it. You know, that type of thing. And then, how to go next? I remember it was very calm. It was like a whole um, um, mathematical... Oh, the next was what they thought they were giving to the other person based on what they thought the other person's needs were and what they thought they were giving to that other person. And then, of course, they had to compare lists to see how discrepant they are. You know, you thought that the most important need of your wife is this, and she has a different thing completely on that list. So it was an interesting exercise. And uh, what happened was, they said it helped, because firstly, it, it forced them to listen to the other person and hear things that they completely had a different perception of. You know? So that was good, and it helped. And uh, so I said, so what happened? Why didn't that work? So they said, the problem was, first of all, just keeping count of all these lists kept them so busy they couldn't fight because they kept looking. And, 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 and secondly, they kept running. She had on the refrigerator, on the refrigerator all the lists. She had it on his office desk. And they're looking every time something happened. I said, where is this on the list? Is it number eight, number nine? How much am I giving? You know, it became so uh, technical. They said it became like crazy. You started having a relationship. It became like a uh, type of, like, like a, some type of... Uh, what do they call it? Um, you know, one of these uh, these games you play. Uh, yeah, one of these contests, these running contests. You're trying to go through hoops and wheels and this, and, and within three minutes, <coughs> they call these races, these relay races. Okay, so that didn't work. <laughs> um, but it was good on paper. It sounded good because it was. Uh, you know, so after I heard that, I, got, I had a great idea. <laughs> so I told them, I want you to create one more list. <laughs> I said, another list. I said, you know, we're doing lists, we might as well have another list. And, and what was that list? But this list actually went, meant to really um, eliminate the other previous ones. I said, this list is, how much do you give? This whole thing is about needs. Your needs, my needs, and how much of it, and how much of it. Give me a list from 1 to 10 of the things you give to the other person. Not based on needs, period. What do you give? What do you bring to this table? What kind of light do you illuminate and warm what kind of light do you give off I said that and I don't really need a list frankly I just need you to think that way the problem is that love in your minds and she reinforced it so her idea was good but it just didn't go all the way was that it's all about needs and the question now is how much of your needs are being fulfilled and how much not so good therapy well you know let's don't get so obsessed with all those needs you know maybe you should be a little more patient when he squeezes the toothpaste from the middle of the tube or, or, you know, something like that. Or you should be more patient when she doesn't put away everything in the closet. Uh, so it's about, like, so-called tempering the needs. That the needs shouldn't be so obsessive. And the other person should try a little better in filling those needs. The problem with it all, it reaffirms 
and reinforces the fundamental flaw that a relationship is based on needs. I'm not saying a relationship should not fill needs, but if it begins and ends there, the big problem. The essence of a relationship, the way the Torah puts it, is it's about giving. Because you have within yourself a soul and the power to give. And you have something to give that's unique and that only you can give. So really you should be giving it to many people in life. And to, uh, but with your spouse, someone you love personally, obviously, that's a primary person in your life where the giving has to be much more intense and much more uh, all-encompassing. That's the bottom line. When you do that properly, needs are automatically filled. Secondly, needs become less dominant. So it's not about concentrating, oh, you know, how, what am I missing? It becomes a life that's dedicated to give. That's what love ultimately is. And there's no question that it counters the current, the current model. I don't know if it's a model or it's a default state. But love, as, it, as, we, as, as we see it in films and in books, and even in therapy, is reinforces the need-driven uh, uh, love, the wick-driven, instead of the light, the flame-driven. So one example of understanding these two types of uh, voices inside of us. Now, do we have needs? Absolutely. But it's interesting how the Baal Shemta looks at a need. He says like this. When a person needs something, or is attracted to something, and he says even, even a color, a physical color, or a food, or a type of person, is because your soul is, attra your soul is attracted to that person, or that ent entity's soul. That, in other words, colors, and foods, and tastes that we have, even physical tastes, that we feel we need, have a need for, and fulfill a need, are driven by spiritual aspirations. However, you know, if your soul came to you and said, listen, I need that, you say, I have no time for you. But since your body needs it, you have plenty of time for it. So God, in his own little interesting way, masquerades our spiritual needs into physical needs. So the inclinations and the preferences we have are actually signposts a lot of what our soul needs. You know, um, I, 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 I always have these debates at the table by us, my family. You know, I personally don't like olives. Okay. Some people love olives. Some people just don't like them. Some people like watermelons, some don't. I was very popular in camp because I didn't like watermelons. Everybody was my friend to get my extra piece of watermelon. That's, my, that's where I learned love from. Just kidding. It's a joke. <laughs> um, but how many people don't like olives in this room? Anybody? Okay. Fine. No olives at all? What do you do when they serve you with olives and you can't get rid of them? That's it. We should have an OA, an Olives Anonymous uh, thing. Uh, you know, all the problems of those. Uh, I don't I'm not, I, it's not that repulsive. You just don't need them. Okay, but what happens if it's like an omelet and there's olives all over inside the omelet? You don't need the omelet? Or you eat around it? No, no. Okay. And what happens when you're in a more sensitive mode? What do you do? Like... No, that somebody who really prepared five hours out of love, a good, nice omelet for you, serves you. Well, I just say it in a very nice, sweet way. <laughs> okay. I got to... It's I, not what you say, it's how you say it. Okay, good. Maybe you can teach us all something. <clears throat> and how are your relationships? Are they, like, intact? <laughs> okay, very good. This was not pre-planned, by the way. Just uh, <laughs> you have to sit down. Isn't it? Okay. And, and what about those who love olives? How many? Yeah. Ah. Okay. But there, there must be something you don't like. What kind of olive? Did so did you expect to come here tonight to find out about this olive lo <laughs> love and hate relationship? <laughs> really? Tell us about it. Was it traumatic? Oh, okay. It wasn't traumatic. <laughs> and now? Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Interesting. <laughs> right. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Okay, well, so since Hanukkah is about olive oil, uh, a bit, Shem and Zayazach. So then I learned, you learn in the Talmud that it says that those that eat olives forget what they study for 70 years. Think about that next time you try one of those feta cheese uh, Greek stuff. Greeks are also connected to Hanukkah, by the way. And... <laughs> And, and then it says, when you, when you eat, uh, drink uh, olive oil, you remember what you studied for 70 years. So, of course, as a kid, you right away ask the question, so if you do both, what does it do, cancel each other out? But the fact is, actually, olives, no one really eats raw, raw olives. It's always either coming from within olive oil or it still has some of it on it. And then I realized, an interesting thing, just since we're sharing, I'll share a little my experience. Uh, later, uh, earlier in my life, I... I, as some of you may know, I spent many years remembering the Lubavitcher Rebbe's talks. So my memory was uh, important. It was a part of remembering many hours of these talks delivered on Shabbos and holidays. And, uh, and then I realized maybe that's why I don't like olives that much, because it may affect my memory. But that's another study, whether those that love olives have weaker memories than those that don't. But we're not going to go there. I don't know if that's really the case. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it, the spiritual meaning behind all of this... <laughs> If I may add, <laughs> and it was all I was really just saying was that our sp our physical preferences and so-called needs also contain within them spiritual energy. So the interesting thing is not only are we givers, but even when we're in a taking mode, and even when we're having a need for something and feel a need, that too is a spiritual sign that there's something there for you to bring light to. So if you gravitate to a particular place in the world, or you have certain interests. So you think, hey, this is my selfish interest. It's interesting that God leads the footsteps of a human being and brings you there in order for you to turn that place or that experience from a wick into a flame. So above all, the lesson from all of this, and I, I applied it to love, but there are other implications of the idea of understanding how we are wicks, waiting to be, a wick waiting to be turned into a flame. So the, the fact, as I said, there are different people and different people whose focus and primary strength may be one or the other but the bottom line is the big picture all of us our ultimately mission is to turn it into a flame and as I said those that are blessed with the wicks or the ability to produce wicks or the ability to understand the ways of this material world the world of commerce the world of finance this vulans um, have, the, have certain unique skills and unique knowledge and unique experience to deliver something that those that are more adept to lamp lighting, either because they're more sensitive or more uh, or more able to reach people or are good good are good role models, they know how to inspire, and they become partners in this, and then you have yourself a, a full flame and wick experience. So this really means on both levels, both personally, we have the wick and flame within us all. We have that material, physical side, and we have the transcendental. And then, of course, in a more collective way, there are some of us that are just more, uh, either more equipped or more skilled at the transcendental, more skilled, others more skilled at the existential. And they too can teach each other much. Many, many things. I remember uh, my father, uh, a blessed memory, was the epitome of uh, the flame type. He came to business, man, I can't tell you, you know, he was a publisher of a newspaper, and had to deal with paying bills, but it was so not practical for him. Like when I would say to him, so I didn't really work with him for that reason, um, but, uh, but I remember I say to him, so, so what's your like, budget for the next year? Just to make a discussion out of it. So he would tell me, you and your numbers. You know, he, he saw that as numbers. You know? Now, he had unbelievable skills. I'm not saying this in a dismissive way. Unbelievable. He could do the work of 20 people, but it was not just a place he didn't go to. It was not like his... You know, for him, it was not the money was not a factor. It was getting the thing done, creativity, whatever you want to call it. So I remember then reading a book, Small Business Bible. I don't know if someone gave me this book, and I reading it. It said there 
that businessmen don't like to invest with artists. And they always put in all kinds of clauses to make sure they don't control, that the artists don't control the, the business, basically. And, the, you know, and uh, it's a notorious battle between artists and business people, whether it's in the music business or in the film business or in the, or in the publishing business or whatever creative things. You're familiar with that? Yeah. yeah. But it said the interesting thing. It said the reason for it is, one of the reasons is because business people are focused more, I'm sorry, the, the artist and the creative person gets off and is, and is satisfied with, it, with getting that art out of his system. And that's it. He doesn't care about anything else. Once he's finished with that, he's finished with his energy. And a business person is busy taking this thing and selling it to as many people as possible. Where the artist doesn't have any more passion than that. He, you know, he got off his, his ego has been expressed through his creativity. Not that he doesn't want it sold, but it's not the same energy that he invested in the creative. Like the morning after he finished, that's where he feels the satisfaction. So therefore, they're almost like two different agendas. And when I read it, it struck me because it reversed the whole idea where usually you think the artist is like the selfless one. You know, they're busy just... The, altru the altruism of creating art. And the business people are the selfish ones. All they care about is making money. And I thought of it, the exact opposite is true. The artist is the selfish one because all he cares about is expressing himself or herself. And is the business person who wants to make many people share and benefit from it. And in effect making money, fine. But the bottom line is that drive brings it to many more people. And the art, and, and I realized this was my father in a real way. He was a writer, an excellent writer. But for him... One person read what he wrote, that was all he needed. Of course he wanted more people theoretically to, but his energy was not invested in the widest distribution. His energy had already been divested in the creation of it, and then got one compliment. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. He would need a partner that knew how to do the second half. Usually a person in one area who's really excellent cannot usually do both effectively. And besides, even if you have the skill, time-wise, you, you just can't... Put your energy in both it's two, it's two different skills and two different types of mindsets. So I came to my father. I decided I have to tell them this. I wanted to hear his reaction to this thought because he was a very smart man. It's like he didn't get it. And I, asked, I also added a different dimension. In, in Kabbalah and Hasidus, there's a concept that says the root of the containers is higher than the root of the light. Okay? So, which literally means like this. You'd think that light is the more powerful force. Like I said earlier, light, flames. And the wick, not that it's not important, but the wick is second, secondary. Yes, it's true, God wanted us to transform matter into spirit, so we need wicks and we need materialism, we need money and so on. But the flame is the higher force, the, the, the soul. And in Kabbalah and Hasidic thought, it says the opposite is true. That the containers that contain energy have a higher spiritual source than the, than the energy itself. Which is similar to this idea, if you're thinking from the point of view as Vulan and Yisachar, or the person who's bringing it to as many people as possible, in many ways is doing something much more profound for the human race than the one who just, um, is just transmitting the, the, the energy and giving off the light, the artist. So I come to my father, I tell him this, and the classic answer, he says, this, that's a great idea, you should write an article about it. <laughs> he basically didn't think of it practically, okay, let's figure out how to bring it to as many as possible. That became another uh, transmission of light. Even the idea that, that, that the containers are, are, more, are, are less selfish, meaning the business people bringing it to many more people, that itself became for him a, another a, a poem or something. You know, like they say, the only two people that will never do tshuva, you know, tshuva is like they'll never repent, is writers and speakers. Because every time they hear an inspiring thought, they say, ah, great material for my next speech. You know, instead of personalizing it, like this is relevant to me, they use it right away, deflect it into, oh, that's great for my speech, that's great for my, you know, for my article, etc., etc. I should know a little about that, so I'm telling you that. <laughs> so there's, like they say, there's no hope for people like that because they're busy. Uh, so you are the victims, and I'm uh, transmitting here. Think of it that way. God forbid. I hope you don't feel that way. I don't feel that way. Um, we're being light about it, okay? <laughs> we'll follow up with more about those olives, by the way. I've I got to hear more about it. There's something going on. There's something going on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so, uh, so you, what you see here is a twist, which is very interesting. So it's not just that the wicks are, are like lights in waiting, or flames in waiting. The wicks have their own power, 
have ability to transform something that the light can never do. And, and th- though it's true that you could say the business person is making more money, or so to speak, bringing it to more people, but the bottom line is, to do so, it has to be brought to more people. And this is a challenge. I've had this myself, this challenge, um, because c- content production I don't have a problem with, but distribution is always a bigger problem. It's interesting. So the distribution you think should be easier. Once you have the content, all you've got to do is distribute it. Coca-Cola, on the other hand, is only about distribution. <laughs> And I guess they have a secret formula, but their mastery of their being the number one brand is all distribution. And when they didn't advertise for a week, and they tested that a few years ago, their sales plummeted. So it's not so much because the, 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 the quality of their drink is something people can't live without. If it's not on their minds, they'll buy something else. So distribution and marketing is an interesting study in how you um, reach large numbers. Obviously, imagine you could combine the best of both worlds, great flames, and great content and great distribution. That would be something. So in this world, some say that it doesn't work because those with the great content don't distribute well. And those that distribute well are usually distributing, I don't want to use any expletives here, but let's put it this way, some things that are not completely uh, content rich. Okay. And uh, so with that being said, the point of the, the implications of this discussion of Flame and Wick and their uh, tension their conflicts, their ability to integrate, not integrate, have tremendous lessons, personal, as you see here, not just personal, but also uh, even reaching areas of business and, uh, and distribution and marketing and content and so on, but also in context of education and imparting ideas and values. Because, for instance, when you're teaching, and I speak to teachers who ask me sometimes different tips, and how do you teach and how are you an effective teacher? And it's, it's so counterintuitive in a way. You tell people, so what's your goal when you teach it? So most people will say to impart knowledge, to impart uh, information, to even inspire. To um, And the list goes on. That's what a teacher you're teaching. Um, and to me, it's always the opposite in a strange way. Not that you're not imparting information or facts or stuff like that, but above all, it's to teach a person to teach themselves. You're almost unteaching. If you really, if you know what I mean, you're trying to get rid of the stereotypes and unhealthy methods of thinking that we have, whether by habit or by routine or by uh, osmosis, and you're trying to f- teach people to hear their own voice. It's a whole different story. So, in the goal of the first teacher, the, te- the goal is: listen, I'm going to impart as much knowledge as I can. I have, let's say, a curriculum, six months. After six months, this is the amount of information the student is going to receive. Nothing wrong per se with that because you need to have goals and you want to impart a certain amount. But it's missing the key point, which is, does the person that you're teaching trust you or the information that's being taught? And they may be interested in studying it for other motives. But until they don't trust it, until they don't have that, like the words from, heart, words from the heart enter the heart, you're missing that dimension. So when you talk about um, a flame and a wick in that context, educational in that sense, so what you really want to do is not just turn uh, a wick into a flame. That's, as I said, is critical, the illumination, to give off your unique light. But also your wick, who you are, what your raw matter is like. That itself should become something that becomes light. Because ultimately, the wick is transformed into a form of light. That's what happens here. And therefore, in that context, education is not just about imparting facts. It's really teaching methodology. It's teaching people how to think. And the courage to think, even more important than what they think and what they, uh, what information they gather, that they, the method of gathering, the method of knowing what is a is important piece of information, what you can discard, to identify the roots from the symptoms, to uh, to think healthy, meaning to look at something and think to the core. Don't be distracted by its uh, byproducts or by by the sideshows but to get to the essence of the idea. And that's transformation. That's not about just imparting something. That's transformation. That's when the wick and the flame become one. And that's why I wanted to mention earlier when Aaron lit the menorah, he, it, it, the Torah insists, insists, not just optional, that he should wait. Bahaloischa means not just bahadla koischa, not just light and ignite and kindle the menorah, the flame, but wait 
until it rises on its own. Which means until the flame rises on its own. Like you see the split second after you light a flame, it takes a second to, to catch. Oxygen, whatever it is. So you can think, big think. So you don't wait. What's the worst scenario? It burns out, you go back and you light it again. Aaron was commanded, no, you cannot do that. You have to wait, wait, wait the extra second, light it, make sure it's burning on its own, rising on its own, then you go to the next one. So the question is asked, why is that so critical? Big thing. The Torah has to change the word, and the answer is because, that's, because we're not just talking about lighting flames, we're talking about lighting lives. We're talking about igniting souls, imparting true values, love, out of love. So, there's, so these little things are critical. The difference is almost life and death. If you don't let it rise on its own, so it's your strength that's holding that person up. So that may be good in times of need or so on, but it's not permanent. Whereas if it's, you allow that wick to become a flame and it begins to rise on its own, you've empowered it with a methodology that even when you're not there, or when the teacher is not there to answer a question, you have the tools to answer your own question. So who, which is the greater teacher? The one that answers all your questions or the one that gives you tools to answer the questions? So initially we'd love the teacher to answer all our questions. It's, it's, it's easier. And maybe in early stages it is that way. But you'll see good teachers will answer questions less and less as the longer you're their student. Because it's not because they, they, they don't have the patience or the time. Because that's a, at some point, what, if the education was successful, you should have the tools to, to be able to answer. And if you don't, the teacher is the one that failed. So a teacher will make sure that's their goal, a good teacher that knows how to light a flame on its own. So that's yet another manifestation of this whole light and wick um, I guess a du 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 duo, or a dance, or whatever you want to call it. And there are many, many more lessons. You know, based on what I just said, after all this talking, at this point you should be able to figure out on your own, you know, flames that rise on their own, more lessons. That would be a good sign that I was successful here. And if you don't figure it out on your own, then you'll have participated in demonstrating that I failed. So, it's your choice. <laughs> uh, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. I hope I was able to impart some methodology, not just idea, ideas. So when you do light the flames this Hanukkah, and you're there and I'm not there, you're able to share some of these ideas or take it even further and apply it to your own homes and lives and families and children. And I think it's a great way, even for children, to, ca to be a catalyst to, of conversation. It doesn't have to necessarily be an intense, full philosophical conversation, but just ideas that you learn from the wicks and the flames. And in any way, it's a mitzvah to sit and watch the flames, and as I said, to listen to the story that they tell. So though it says in the Haner Salolo, which is the prayer we say, the song we sing right after the lighting of the Hanukkah flames, we say, We don't have permission to use them, the flames. You're not supposed to read, to the, read by the light of the flame or any other way because it's like sacred. The only thing we have a right to do is look at them. So you could think, well, looking at them and learning a lesson is using them? No. Using them is when you use them for your needs. Whereas opposed to learning from them, then you are sublimating yourself to the flames and, le and, le and letting them teach you instead of you teach them, so to speak. So it's also a lesson in giving as opposed to taking. Instead of us just using flame, you know, you light a flame, okay. It's a, I could read a book by the light of the flame, or I can light another flame from it. You're not supposed to light a flame from the Hanukkah flames, only from the Shamish, from the main flame. And other things, not to use it, because it has a certain element of, of appreciating that you need to give and not always take. So even these flames, we're not taking from them, we're learning from them, to, le to learn to be givers. So, as Hanukkah quick, uh, swiftly approaches... Well, it's as swiftly as the hours roll on, not faster because we speak about it, but when you enter something well prepared, obviously you appreciate it more. So we'll be coming this Friday evening before sun set. We light the Hanukkah, we light the, the, light, we light the Hanukkah menorah um, to think about some of these ideas. And we have eight days, so there are many different ideas and thoughts as the flames intensify in number. And... Um, since we're on the subject, so the sixth flame will be next Wednesday night, if you, if my, if you count right. And we will be doing our, uh, we had a rehearsal today, which was quite interesting. So uh, I never did a rehearsal before in my life. 
um, usually wing it, but this was a real rehearsal, so uh, it was very powerful. Did any of you ever hear of a didgeridoo? <laughs> What's a didgeridoo? Anyway, so we had a didgeridoo, we call a didge player, it was here. And uh, it's an interesting uh, instrument, he had two different didgeridoos. He has nine, he told me. So I learned a lot about didgeridoos. I may even write an article about it. It just intrigued me. Didgeridoo is this, they, they consider it to be the world's oldest uh, wind instrument. Except I think the chauffeur comes before that. Because the chauffeur, uh, so I looked in Wikipedia and it doesn't say that, but we'll have to add a little footnote. The Jews always have one up or something. But it's an, old, it's an ancient Australian wind instrument. It's like, a, it's like a branch, really. A hollow piece of wood. And the hollowness is actually, I asked the guy, how much does it cost? He said, it ranges from $500 a did, it would do, in case you're interested in buying one. Um, you don't need to give me a gift of that, in case any of you are thinking about that. Better just make a donation to Meaningful Life Center. <laughs> we'll buy our own did reduce. But uh, uh, from 500 to $10,000, so I asked him, what is it, be- like, what, what, what the, the distinguished, not the tree, the amount of termites that, that, that the carved out to that uh, eat through the hollow, which creates this, the, the unique sound. And he actually had, he had a, today he brought an F didgeridoo, it's on the F uh, the thing, and D. And uh, the guy with the guitar, Avram Pengus, it was very interesting. So you'll all have a real taste of this, and uh, I, my job is to figure out how it fits in with Hanukkah, but I have already some idea. Um, I'm working on that. So, but, but we're going to have a real fascinating, interactive, uh, I, I, guaranteed, unprecedented for sure. I don't know if anybody played a didgeridoo at a Hanukkah celebration. But that's not just the playing of it, it's just the story of Hanukkah being told in three movements. I've got a whole thing here with drums for everybody and music and uh, story and narrative. It should be quite a powerful evening. I definitely encourage you. I mean, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, you can see it's a little exciting for me. So um, I encourage you. Last year we had a pretty uh, sellout crowd, so you can sign up right now up front here by Golda Malka or uh, Velvo. They'll be very kind about it. And um, if anybody's interested in sponsoring the party, being a sponsorship, even if you, if you can make it great, even if you can't, you definitely can appreciate that because it's not a cheap uh, production, so to speak. And we'll have uh, our traditional, our unique, what we had last year, a good, nice donut machine, fresh new donuts being made. So if you're starting your diet, start after the party, um, you know, after January 1st, if you like. And also a good latke station, gourmet latkes, and uh, a beer bar. Anyway, that's the plug for this uh, for this party. You should have, it'll be a great time. Seven thirty next Wednesday night. Seven thirty next Wednesday, right here. Okay. One second. Didn't finish yet. And I want to finally say this class, talking about sponsorships, is dedicated to, dedicated by, a good friend, Mark Belinsky, in honor of his great uncle Alta Bamoisha, whose yard site is on the twenty third of Kislev which is, yeah, basically now, today, December 10th. And also, I want to dedicate it personally to Kenny Vance, who was here a few weeks ago, one of the founding uh, members of this, uh, of this, whatever you want to call this, this uh, interaction, this uh, the Wick and Flame experience, who has his birthday today as well. Um, and I want to thank you all for your happy birthdays, especially on Facebook, has made everybody very uh, cordial. Again, a lot of thank you, a lot of happy birthdays, you know, because that's what your birthday is. But I will tell you that Facebook only reflects my, the birthday of my uh, animal soul. My divine soul is, was born a few weeks from now, well, actually, right after Hanukkah, a week from now. The 5th of Tavis is the Hebrew birthday. But it's still 8th of, uh, my, my license is the 8th of December, so I want to thank you for your blessings. And I bless you all in turn. Uh, with many, uh, many blessings materially and spiritually, and to take your wicks and turn them into flames, and fusing it all together, may we be great partners and bring a lot of light into this world. And next Hanukkah, we shall do it in a way that's going to be quite empowering. Please share it with your friends. Everybody here has their sphere of uh, influence and friends, and I really would uh, welcome anyone, new people and so on, and have a great time. So have a happy Hanukkah, and I'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you very much.